Good afternoon, everybody. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. And welcome back after lunch. I hope you all had a good lunch and a chance to talk to each other, which is also very important. Um, my name is Maureen O'Neill, and I'm really pleased to um, be here to chair this afternoon's session. Um, I'm here because I'm a member of the European Economic and Social Committee, and this afternoon, in the first session, we'll be looking at dimensions from different parts of Europe, as well as other ideas from, from the panel, who I will introduce shortly. Um, for those of you who probably don't know what the European Economic and Social Committee is, it's an advisory body to the European institutions. So we're all drawn from either NGOs, acad academia, uh, trade unions or employer groups. And our job is to comment on proposals from the Council, the Parliament and the Commission to give an ordinary person's perspective on these issues, a non-political um, decision. So what I want to do um, to begin with is to give a very short introduction to the kind of perspectives and outcomes that there have been in relation to attitudes, um, not just Brussels, but um, across the EU to issues around poverty. And I was actually very pleased um, that Archbishop Centenu said that we are in Europe and somebody else then pointed out one of the benefits of being in Europe was to be able to fund an innovative service that they're offering and that is true um, for a number of organisations. So there are benefits but we also need to take the opportunity to input into our European institutions things that perhaps need streamlined or changed. So we're always pleased to do that in our committee. I just want you to make two comments about this morning which I thought were really important. One, it was very important to have a reality check on what it feels like to be poor and isolated. Because what we do all the time, and I include myself, is I discuss policy, but we don't look at implementation nearly as much as we ought to. So policy is really important, but it needs to be grounded, and I think that came across really strongly. And the other one I think came across from a session was, let's not be afraid of the grit. Let's actually take the grit on board and be challenging for what needs to happen. And I think we need to be um, clear about that. I wanted to just say a little bit about um, the European context, because we're working to something called the 2020 strategy. And we have heard this morning about the targets that the UK government a setting in relation to eradicating, reducing poverty by 2020. And that's embedded in the European 2020 strategy. And that's where the focus has come from and where uh, members of the European Council have actually made a commitment to reducing poverty. So there's the European level, there's the national level, and there's the local level. And to do this, um, they set up one of the flagship initiatives in this was the 20, it was the platform against poverty. And it was there to be a dynamic force to involve key stakeholders across Europe to fight poverty and social exclusion. Um, and we looked at the, the targets, which were the indicators, um, actually, those at risk of poverty, those living in households who had no job, and those experiencing severe deprivation, material deprivation. And when the strategy was put in place in 2010, 80 million people had been identified as at risk of poverty. However, the Commissioner, Commissioner Andor, who's responsible for this strand of work, identified late in 2013 that actually it's now 125 million. So far from reducing, poverty across Europe is exactly the same as we're experiencing in the UK. It's increasing. It's a result of the financial crisis bringing the lack of growth and jobs. Um, similarly, um, President Barroso called on member states to reduce inequality and mobilize the structural funds 
in order to increase social inclusion and social innovation with an emphasis on regional and local levels. So I think you can see there are synergies with what we discussed this morning. Um, the financial crisis and the introduction of austerity measures in all, member, in all member states to some level or others, and some more, much more severely, have really affected the ability of member states to address poverty reduction targets. And we've seen, as we've said, rising levels of poverty and growing inequality between and within member states. So we're all experiencing in the 28 member states um, the same kind of issues. And I think one of the things that we've pointed out is that this brings a lack of cohesion um, between um, the member states in terms of um, trying to find a consensus about the way forward. So the Commission's communication taking stock of Europe 2020, which aimed to be smart, sustainable and inclusive, um, means that we have an increase in the number of people experiencing poverty. We're drifting further away from meeting the target and there's no real sign of being able to remedy the situation and that we're actually looking at um, a number that's closer to 100 million in 2020 rather than a reduction. Um, and I think the situation is particularly aggravated in member states um, in terms of severe material deprivation and the share of jobless households and the, the erosion of social protection systems. So what are the lessons that the committee that I'm involved in has taken out of this? And we do speak to stakeholders very consistently and it's very much part of our remit. Austerity measures have really created a problem that's going to take not only time, but a very um, innovative approach to try and resolve. One of the issues raised this morning was a dramatic rise in those who are working but experiencing poverty, and that needs to be um, addressed, and we need to find ways of um, addressing that. We also felt very strongly right from the beginning that the emphasis was always on fiscal um, remedies rather than having a balance between the fiscal requirements and social need. And I think there has been a call for a rebalancing of this, but ec the economics always seems to take precedence. The other issue was a lack of stakeholder involvement in looking at devising and implementing anti-poverty strategies. And they called at through the Commission to have a much more structured approach that actually reflected what people said in member states through national governments and into, um, the, into the Commission and the European institutions in order for there to be consistency and in order to be um, assured that there would be a level of um, implementation that was important. So stakeholder involvement is critical and one of the things that always comes up when our member states um, and the UK, you put together a national reform program, a national action program, a significant loss in that is not having had sufficient stakeholder involvement. We haven't listened to the reality of what it means as much as we should. There's a much stronger emphasis um, for investment, and we're looking at something called the social investment package, and it will be important. 20% of that um, money available from Europe that we need to access is to go towards the reduction of poverty in member states. We need a commitment from national governments and regional government in order to access some of that money, whether we're in NGOs or whether we're um, in, in government, the statutory sector. Um, we need to, to look at what a living wage looks like, and the Commission has something called a reference budget, which is um, beginning to evolve in order to think about what a minimum income should look, look to. Child poverty is high on the agenda. Cohesion is really important. We have to stop fragmentation of services. Really, one of the lessons I learned this morning was we've got lots and lots of evidence. We can keep reproducing evidence 
and policy papers, we actually have to do something with the evidence that we've got. We cannot sit on our hands and not do anything. So the lesson for us is implement, implement, implement. Thank you very much. And can I move to our panel? I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves, and then after that, they'll each have a little time, five minutes or so, to um, make their statements. Following that, it's open to all of you, and we'll round up questions um, and answers or responses from the panel about quarter past three. I have strict instructions that we have to stop at half past three um, in order for the last session to get a good chunk of time as well. So, Professor Allegretti. Yeah. <clears throat> Just introduce yourself uh, yes, first yeah. and then we'll go. Uh, my name is Giovanni Allegretti. I am uh, Italo-Portuguese. I work in the University of Coimbra in Portugal as a researcher. And I have been recently named by the Parliament of Tuscany region in Italy as chair of a new institution created by law, which is called uh, Independent Authority for the Promotion and the Guarantee of People Participation in Policies. Thank you. Alan. <coughs> I'm Alan Walker. I come from the University of Sheffield. I'm in the room, I think, because I chaired the Sheffield Fairness Commission. My name is uh, Ati Hoekman, and I work for the city of Delft in Holland. Uh, I'm Roland Atkinson. I'm director of the Research Centre for Social Sciences here at York. Uh, I'm an urban sociologist uh, based here at the university. Thank you very much. Alan, would you like to start us off? Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much, Maureen, for the, for the introduction and overview. As I say, um, I'm here because I chaired the Sheffield Fairness Commission, which reported in February 2013. You've just got to Google uh, Fairness Commission Sheffield, and you, you go to the website. Everything is there. And um, I guess what's different about the Sheffield Fairness Commission is certainly different from York because it, it's, it was a rather inclusive endeavor. We tried to make sure that all of the key stakeholders were around the table as part of the discussion. And when I was asked to, to chair the Sheffield Fairness Commission, uh, one of the agreements with the leader of the Sheffield City Council was that it would be a whole city fairness commission. So unlike the, the York Advisory um, Commission to the local authority, it seemed crucial to me that if we were going to tackle inequality, we needed all of the stakeholders in the room, the public sector and the private sector. And we managed to, to do that. And the second different thing about the Sheffield Fairness Commission compared to some others is that we have followed the launch of the Fairness Commission with the Sheffield Fair City campaign. So the council has put aside some money to fund a campaign that will last uh, at least two years to try to drive the messages about fairness down uh, and engage with local communities so that it becomes a completely collaborative endeavor. Now, in terms of what we're focusing on today, I'll just comment on two main issues. The first of those is Europe, and the second is, is the conundrum of place, which I must confess to having certain ambivalence about that I'll try to share with you as briefly as I can. On the European front, I've spent more or less four decades studying inequalities in later life across all European countries. And if I had to distill the main lesson from all of that work on inequalities in old age, I could put it in two words. Politics matter. Of course, if this was a lecture, I'd spend a whole lot uh, more time <laughs> giving you the background detail. But politics matter. Why is it that the poverty rate in the UK is three times that in Sweden? Why is it that the poverty rate in the UK is four times that in the Czech Republic? Politics. 
purely politics. It's not about being in the north or the south. It's not about the culture or the language. It's ideology stroke politics. Why is it that healthy life expectancy at the age of 65 is 14 years in Denmark and two years in Latvia? Why is it that Swedes, on average, have a three to four years extra healthy life expectancy than those in the UK? Politics. Not culture, politics. Why does Sweden spend three times as much as this country on social care? You know that social care is in crisis. You don't need the Joseph Rowntree Foundation to tell you. You can see it on the streets. And the key to that crisis is spending. France and the UK have the same proportion of their population aged 80 and over. So if you're thinking, oh, it's demography, they just have more older people, so they spend more money. No, it's not so. Same proportion of population as the UK, aged 80 and over, France spends twice as much on social care as the UK. It's politics, and that is the fundamental issue. And it's why fairness commissions are so important because they must be about addressing the political messages, about the political discourse. We have to change that. As you said earlier, sir, there's a lockdown about what we can afford, the austerity lockdown. We have to change that debate, because other countries that went through a similar financial crisis are spending more on those key things that make our, our lives rich. So it's politics. We can learn lessons from different European countries. We can swap ideas and so on. But the crucial barrier is a political barrier. Unless we crack that barrier, we will not get greater fairness in this country. That's the crucial thing. And that's the main lesson that I draw from quite a lot of work on, on Europe. Now, place. Place is important, of course it is, but we have to be careful that we don't overstate the importance of place. The danger of overstatement is that we atomize different places and we, we almost individualize the problems that are national or global. And we say it's up to cities to cope with these problems, or from an earlier session, it's up to schools to cope with these problems. So we try to suggest that problems can be solved within small localities. And they can't be. They can adjust. They can make contributions. But what we need is national action. That's a political issue. In Sheffield, before we embarked on our Fairness Commission, we learned a lot from York and from London, and from Durham. And it's important that we share that information and that we don't see our locality as being a special place. That means it has to be only about this locality, our Fairness Commission, or whatever we call it, our charter, uh, our, our commitments, because we can share those between different places. And we can agree what are the fundamental elements of, of those um, uh, commitments or principles. Some of you may remember in the distant past something called the educational priority areas in the 1960s, where there was an attempt to solve poverty by focusing resources in small localities. And the research on the EPAs came up with what they called the ecological fallacy. If you concentrate on small localities in trying to tackle poverty, there will always be more poverty outside of those localities than inside. It's the same in cities. We must be very careful about the dispersal of deprivation and poverty. And we can't run away with the idea that it's all concentrated in small localities, because there's always more outside the small locality than inside. So my starting point, colleagues, 
would be a national framework for fairness. I would appoint under DWP a minister for social justice to nail it as a political priority at the highest level. It's there that I would enforce the living wage, fair, a code for fair employment that includes the ratio from top to bottom in organizations, in pay levels, uh, training facilities to, to enable people to, to upskill and so on. Ending fuel poverty, inheritance taxes, unused land and empty housing taxes, targets for reducing health inequalities, uh, such as premature death among people with learning disabilities and people with mental health problems, they need to be set as, as national targets. We can't push those down to small localities and say, get on with it. It's a national priority, and that means it's a political priority. Then, once you've got the national framework, there can be a set of basic principles or a charter which underpins a local fairness strategy. And they could be the same across the country, but with local badges. If you go on to the, the, uh, the Sheffield Fairness Commission website and look at the Sheffield Charter for Fairness and compare it with the York Charter, they're actually rather different because the York Commission <coughs> is focusing on advising the local council, whereas what we try to do in Sheffield is lay down basic principles for the whole society and the personal role that individuals can play in that. So key principles such as those with the broadest shoulders should be asked to take the biggest load. Those in the greatest need need to be given the highest priority. Key priorities like that that help to adjust thinking at local level when decision makers are coming to to resource distribution or how they deal with other people, how the, the level of respect they give to, to other people. Thinking of Europe as a whole, we know that there are massive variations, north, south, east, west. And as I've said already, you've got those big variations in outcomes, in healthy life expectancy, and so on. And what that means is we have to be sensitive to nation and locality and culture but we can still have the same basic principles of approach and apply those in whichever area we live. It worries me that there's a proliferation of local charters and local commitments, and that worry is based on the fact that that might diffuse the need for a combination of our approaches to push the political message to Whitehall in, in this country or the European Commission for Europe as a whole. So that reflects uh, my ambivalence about place. But on the other hand, I have to recognize that place has a valuable resonance in the campaign for fairness. We can use attachment to locality as a key element in persuasion, because that's what it's about. If we want fairness, we have to change attitudes in society. And this cuts two ways. On the positive side, we've set an ambition for Sheffield to be the fairest city in the country. OK, we didn't set that ambition in the spirit of competition. We set it because people in Sheffield have pride in their city. And we want them to feel pride to be part of, to get on board, to join in the campaign. Yes, we want to be the fairest city, not fairer than Doncaster or York. That's not what it's about. It's about getting people involved and enthusiastic about the campaign, to persuade them from a position of local pride. So it doesn't matter to me if Doncaster comes along and says, we want to be the fairest city, or York, and so on and so on. It's about getting people involved in the debate. On the negative side, we've tried to elicit shame for people in Sheffield that their city, their fair city as they think of it, is actually scarred by deep inequalities. Inequalities in life expectancy from the center of the city to the periphery of 10 years. 
And we try to use that, that pride in the city, to make people feel ashamed that in their city those inequalities exist. Secondly, it's easier in one locality to get the infrastructure going, to join up the different uh, organizations, exec boards, local economic partnerships, and so on. And thirdly, place is important because any campaign on fairness must involve local grassroots organizations. A locality is critical in that. So in the Sheffield fairness approach, we are appointing local champions for fairness. In, at the neighborhood level. That's volunteers who agree to take on the task of arguing for fairness locally. So in summary, sorry Maureen, I would say we need a national framework and we need local application that respects local priorities and empowers local communities. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I introduce myself as saying uh, I'm Ati Hoekman working for the city of Delft and I'm going to tell you something about the local circumstances in Delft. Delft is a, sm a city uh, in the west of Holland, about 100,000 uh, inhabitants and it's famous because of the Delft Blue Pottery, a famous painter Vermeer and of its technical university. In our city uh, we do have uh, rich people but also very poor people, and about 6.3% of the households live on a so-called social minimum, so they don't have much money to spend. But when we speak in Delft of poverty, it by all means it is in not only not having enough money, it's also about more, it's more about more, it's about a lack of education, we heard it this morning. But it's also being unable to participate because your parents don't have any money for you to go with a school trip. And it's about uh, living and uh, don't have any perspective of better circumstances. So poverty is social exclusion. And we tried, uh, we consider it to be our responsibility of the mun municipality, I'm sorry, <laughs> Uh, to support people who live in poverty. And we can't do it on our own, but there are some things we can do. So uh, the best way, in our opinion, to get out of poverty is to get work. So people who are um, unemployed, we do try to help them to go to work. And if work isn't possible yet, then we help them to participate in, the com in uh, some activities because when you're going to participate you feel part of the community and it's very good for your self-esteem. Then of course there are social benefits and special benefits for extra costs you couldn't foresee. And when people are in debt, and a lot of people in Delft do have debt, we try to help them to um, solve the debt and to uh, we make appointments with, for instance, housing companies, uh, companies uh, for um, uh, health insurance, to give us a signal, signal so that if, you, if one doesn't pay his bills, they, we send immediately a letter, well, hey, you didn't pay your bills, maybe you do have some problems. If you wish, we can help you, so contact us. And then special attention for kids. There was a survey in Holland uh, about special needs for ki uh, children living in poor families and they told us four things. One of them, I think we heard them all four this morning. Children want to uh, take, uh, uh, will uh, take part at school activities like a, a trip with school. So in Delft we support that and we also help children to uh, participate with sports or with cultural activities. And we do have the Delft Pass, and that's an, um, uh, a special yeah, card for every inhabitant of Delft. Everyone can buy it, and with that card you can go to, for instance, the zoo or go uh, to a museum or other uh, um, uh, go to, um, oh dear, <laughs> uh, 
no, sorry, that would be the word. And especially for the Delft Pass is for children who live in poor families or uh, the parents of their, those children, the Delft Pass is free, but for all other inhabitants you have to pay. So when someone has a Delft Pass you can't see whether he's poor or not, so he can particip participate at the maximum. And last but not least, in Delft we also have the Pact Against Poverty. Several uh, organizations take part of it. For example, churches, housing companies, political parties, uh, health insurance company. Uh, and we all work together, welfare uh, organizations. And in this pact, we work together to beat poverty by exchange experiences, learn from each other, help people to find their way to assistance and building a network. And thanks to this pact against poverty, several initiatives have emerged in Delft, like a holiday exchange, a library for toys, and clothes distribution. So that was a short look of how we did in Delft. Thank you very much for the invitation. I come from two of the most unequal countries that we have in Europe, especially Portugal in these moments, and where the crisis is, uh, is still uh, very visible. So this is a problem that uh, is affecting uh, all of us, even uh, when we try to imagine a, a new uh, solution. And I, I, I want to, to start with a, um, a premise. Uh, which is um, that uh, fairness is about uh, recognition and redistribution. So uh, the role of people which is affected by uh, inequality has to be recognized as central in imagining the solution for their condition. And in order to do that, it's important to put these people at the same level of all the others, so created equality in access to the spaces of power. That's why I come from uh, two experiences that, uh, although very different, uh, I think have something in common. The experience in the Tuscan region where I have been elected to this new authority for guarantee and promotion of participation is an experience that was created uh, partially top-down. It means that there have been a, a strong debate of uh, three years uh, on this uh, new um, um, law on participation. The law was written together with people uh, in three years of debates around uh, the region. And in 2007, it entered in force uh, uh, lasting for five years and being renovated, uh, renewed in, in its context, uh, in its context last year. And uh, the renovation uh, was very interesting because it was mainly a top-down political processes and politicians uh, were engaged in a, in a, in a strong uh, debate on uh, what space to give uh, to participation in the politics uh, of uh, the regional governments. And they ended up in creating something very binding for them, which is a law that obliges uh, the, the, the region and all its municipalities to do participatory processes for four months on every big infrastructure that will be uh, created in the, in the region. Uh, beyond the 50, uh, 50 millions of euro, which is almost all the, all the infrastructures in the area. And for this, uh, for binding themselves, they created this authority, which I coordinate now, uh, which is a controller. And they put in the law something that I think is very important, which is uh, a strong commitment to responsiveness. So all the local and regional institutions have the obligation to give back an answer to people after they do their proposals in the participatory processes. So it's not possible anymore to end the participatory processes, leaving people in the dub that they think their recommendation will not be taken into account. So I think that this is the real idea of uh, uh, introducing uh, participation as 
a right because when there is a duty for the institution to answer to people, uh, they still continue to have the final power to decide, but this is the way in which our institutions are conceived by national law, so it was not possible to change it in, at regional level. But they, they must be responsiveness, uh, and they created commissions for controlling the implementation of what has been in the end co-decided. Among the instruments that this law uh, created, uh, there is one very interesting, it's 700,000 uh, euros that I manage every year uh, with my colleagues to distribute to uh, interesting processes of participation proposed in a call for project by the local authorities. And uh, this year we decided to change the criteria in order to put fairness in the center of the future projects because uh, our impression was that although trying to change the, the power relationships, uh, there was still something wrong in the participatory processes that have been produced in the last five years, which was that they were more centered in the idea of democratizing democracy than in the idea to tackle inequalities. So. Uh, uh, in our view, the new, the new uh, director board of this institution, there, there are no results in tackling inequality and in social inclusion if there are no goals for doing that. Because uh, only goals can guarantee the use of coherent means uh, to uh, make the access equal to everybody. So, um, uh, in this case, enter the idea of spaces. Now, spaces are, for us, physical spaces, but also are uh, uh, arenas that we created in order to give people a different kind of power. The idea of learning by doing is also the idea that the people most affected by inequality are the people that do not believe in institutions. So, to create a a virtual circle in, in, of legitimation of the states, we need to give more space to these people. And the way to do is, uh, there are several ways possible. I, I will just uh, um, uh, list uh, three or four because my, my time is, uh, is almost uh, off. So, uh, for example, the, the first thing that has been said this morning is uh, spaces of information uh, that can uh, make people realize of the inequality level because we do not experience necessarily in our daily life this inequality. So uh, we need to go beyond affective mapping, so knowing just the parts of the city in which we live and we don't know the others. So, for example, some cities have created caravanas, which are sort of collected visits during the participatory processes done before the voting of uh, uh, final priorities, because the idea of the majority of these processes, the, the, we only fund uh, co-decisional processes. We don't fund consultative processes. So the idea is that people before deciding has the duty, not only the right, to know better their own cities in order to understand if what they are deciding on is uh, urgent or not. So we do collected visits and, and people start to know things that they never, uh, they never uh, uh, discovered before. So I, I have a PowerPoint when I, when I teach where I put a lot of pictures of proposals with uh, scores zero. What does it mean, this? that some people did proposal and then they even did not vote for them because they discovered in the public dialogue that there were things much more urgent than those that they have been created with their mind on the base of a, a lack of knowledge of the territory. And then other things like commission for following implementation because as Maureen was telling before, sometimes we forget that the importance is not just uh, uh, setting policies, it's making these policies effective. So um, uh, see the results, the final results, because it's the only way to restore the credibility of the states in front uh, of people, especially people affected by inequalities. And uh, another thing is storytelling. This morning when uh, uh, Stacy was talking about her experience, was very, very emotional for me. And we discovered it, we are doing a, an experience in my university about uh, storytelling for public policies. We, uh, for example, we are working with migrants. We stay three days with the same group of 12 migrants. We tell, each one tells stories. 
continuing a small phrase. And they have the time, they give themselves the time to listen to the other, to echo the other, to react to the others, to resonance, you know? And so in the end, in the third day, they come up almost naturally translating these personal stories into public policies, into ideas and recommendations. And I think this is very important for another thing, because participation has been transformed in the last year in a sort of struggle among poors. Like you have like a bone and you, you throw to 10 dogs and, and say, the, the stronger will win. And, that, and that's totally wrong. So storytelling in the beginning of a participatory processes help yeah, I know, <laughs> I'm finishing. Um, uh, help people to create a sort of community link before entering in the competitive part of the participatory decision making. And so I think that's all this, and, and we can have more, but uh, are, are important things. And that's why I wanted to uh, finish saying that uh, this is the experience in Tuscany, but in Portugal it's happening the same with the spread of participatory budgeting. We had a lot of more than 60 consultative participatory budgeting. They all died in the last year. The only 16 that survived the last year and that became uh, uh, 32 this year, already after the new election, who changed completely the panorama because we have a new law that forbids polit uh, mayors to be re-elected after three terms. So now we have all a new generation of mayors that came out uh, during the crisis, so in the last seven years, so they are much more sensitive to these issues. So these new participatory budgeting process are all binding and co-decisional. That is a natural uh, transformation that happens because they realized that people was not moved by just places in which they were informants. They are tired to be informants, okay? And so they want to co-decide. So that's why we are in this transformation in the moment. The networking for us, as Alan was, said, was saying before, is very important in order to acquire a, um, a critical mass in front of the state and transform, because inequality is not a about local problems, it's about uh, unjust structure of society, of the market, of the, the tax uh, uh, structure. So uh, we cannot face them at local level just. And so it's very important to network and be strong all together to uh, tackle inequality. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> decision there. Did you notice? Little cough and he stopped. Almost. <laughs> Almost. Almost. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll do my best to stick to about five minutes. Um, I'm going to speak from an academic perspective. You can probably tell that because I'm wearing patches on my uh, jacket. Um, and I'm going to talk about how place matters, but I'm going to do that from the perspective of, uh, or at least about the issue, the elephant in the room that we haven't really talked about much today. Uh, and that's the position of the wealthy and the super rich, upon which uh, I am leading a project looking at, uh, at London. And um, I've, I could talk extensively about conditions of poverty. I cut my teeth at the Department of Urban Studies in, in Glasgow, uh, walking in the streets of uh, peripheral housing estates in Glasgow and Edinburgh. Did a lot of work on area effects and how it is worse to be poor in a poor neighbourhood than an area which is more uh, uh, socially mixed. Um, but I'm not going to do that now because I think increasingly that we need to have our eyes on the bigger, the way that the, the larger system affects uh, those people with fewer resources in our uh, societies. Um, I think uh, Kirsten this morning started off by talking in, at least in very briefly on the work of Thomas uh, Piketty. Uh, and of course he is arguing that, uh, or at least one of his arguments, is that the financial crisis that we f have found ourselves in was generated by inequality, that those people at the bottom of the pile did not have enough resources to consume effectively, which sort of sent us in, into uh, the kind of crisis that we find ourselves in. And of course, we've been told that one of the major uh, uh, routes out of that is that we need to stand together, we need to work together, uh, we're all in this together. And of course, we know that that's a lie. We know that the distribution of these problems is profoundly unequal. And those people who espouse that perspective come from a highly privileged position, which is largely insulated from the experience of poverty around them. 
Now, I've just been reading the Knight Frank Global Wealth Report, which tells us that in the UK there are 10,000, just over 10,000, ultra high net worth individuals, 4,000 4, of them in London. That's people with disposable liquid assets of around £20 million plus. There are 100 billionaires in the UK, 72 of them live in London. I don't know how many live in New York. Um, and it, these raise important political questions about place. Why are those people con particularly interested in living in London? What do they derive from that space? I'll come back to that in a moment. But there, of course, is this enormous politics around uh, the sense of London is winning because people are investing in that space. Now, the question is, what does it win when we know that there are around about a million people on housing waiting lists, when we see people being displaced as a result of uh, pressures in the housing system, either through gentrification or various forms of welfare reform. Uh, these enormous inequities are largely being sidelined by the sense of the capital as this new great repository for those people who've got wealth, and we should be, in some sense, uh, uh, pleased uh, because of that. I'm talking in my political mode rather than my academic mode now. So what can we see? I think we can see that the role of inequality, the housing system, is critical in producing the kind of local social mosaics that we all pick up on in our everyday uh, working lives, that we see people around us who are living in areas of concentrated poverty, who are struggling to get by. But of course that's produced by these kind of systemic imperatives. So I think place is absolutely critical here, but we need to have our eyes on the, on the ball, on the, broad, the broader game here. So we can ask about how local, very deprived areas hold people back. We can ask how they might be made better places through forms of physical regeneration. I'm not decrying any of those important initiatives. We can also ask about how people can organise better social outcomes for themselves and for other people living in their localities. We can talk about the pressures on services in those localities, how people get a, a, a raw deal from local schools because of the intense pressure on those services, the kind of concentration effects that many people working in those professions really struggle with on a daily basis. And we can also, of course, talk about the kind of stigmatisation that people experience when they're trying to uh, go for jobs and so on, and the kind of discrimination they face as a result of the places that they live in, and the kind of shame, actually, that people experience as well. But we know that in talking about how people might get out of those situations, how they might in some way participate in society, society itself has imploded, essentially. There is no municipal space in which people might then engage. And this is the arguments that colleagues of mine have been making quite recently, that to talk about social exclusion, well, we need to look at how society itself has, has changed. There has been a massive assault on the municipal, on shared forms of provision. And much of that, you, we don't really get much of a different take on that, regardless of the kind of political colour of the people that we might vote for. So to go back to the point about politics, of course politics matters, but in the way it's currently, constitu currently constituted, and the kind of massive vested interests that lie within that, I don't think we're going to see any particularly significant action on challenging what Piketty argues is that we should see an enormous amount of taxation on unearned income and capital in order to fund the kind of programmes that we're all desperately trying to uh, uh, assemble. Now, the broader, question, the broader issue also raised here is that what happens in London affects all of us, not just because of the nature of that economy, but I would argue that because that city is essentially being prepared for capital. It's being prepared for the needs of the extremely rich as a kind of playground for their social needs, but also as a space for them to invest in in terms of property. And politicians don't want to challenge that narrative. They want to sell that as a success story, they circulate in an environment which is essentially, again, insulated from the kind of conditions that many of us would be more familiar with. Even the Daily Mail is angry about the rich right now. <laughs> so what we're seeing here is a kind of breakdown of the social contract that many people are trying to assemble in their daily social, uh, uh, in, in, their, in their working and professional lives. I would argue that, broadly speaking, for the rich, these problems don't matter. If we went back to the 1950s, many of the arguments would be about how we need to pay our tax, we need to pay and invest in civic society, because if we don't do that, we produce the kind of degraded and, and potentially dangerous social environment that affects all of us. Now, what we've seen in the, most, in the recent decades is the capacity of the very wealthy, upper middle classes and so on, to essentially evade their responsibility and to insulate them themselves from those kind of risks. 
If it's about crime, we'll move into a gated community. If it's about poor quality school provision, we'll move into private provision for our educational needs. It doesn't matter anymore, those kind of arguments. So we need to be making much more forceful uh, political arguments and demands that these people be brought back into civic society, essentially. So this is a, a, a political, social, and financial elite, and that's reflected in the kind of politics that we see around us today. The place operates to contain the poor in areas of public housing and so on, largely away from the perspectives of those people who are the policymakers. Now the question that arises out of all of this is what do we do about it? How do we channel our anger into the kind of political process as it currently stands? And I have no pat responses to those kind of questions. How do we make elegant arguments that get the attention of those people and make the most forceful possible uh, demands and achieve a kind of buy-in from people, regardless, I think, of their political uh, position? So that's the challenge I want to kind of leave us with today. As I said, I've got no, no answers, but that might be the, the kind of thing that we might begin uh, perhaps to talk about. So I shall finish there. Thank you. Well, I think our speakers have given us quite a lot of challenges that we need to think about. You know, do we still have a social contract? Is participation good enough? Is it all about politics? Um, implementation? Are we not in it altogether? So I think a number of challenges, so it's open to you. Can you keep your statement or question quite brief? The microphone's coming round. Thank you. May I thank the, the, yeah, the panelists for their enlightening explanations. Um, but I was particularly interested in um, Professor Walker's two important points uh, from their work with the fairness um, in Sheffield. One was that a local fairness depends and also affects the national fairness. And that should equally follow that the national fairness requires regional fairness, and the regional fairness requires international fairness. It's just like, um, well, that was the second point that you mentioned about creating fairness in one place could cause poverty if you are equating with the poverty in another place. So if we are concentrating our thoughts and minds, what we are learning from Europe as well, that if we are concerned on national issues, national fairness, by implication, it's going to create unfairness elsewhere. In 1992, I think it was in the, in the Rio conference, international conference by the United Nations, when they were addressing the north and south divide internationally, they came to the same conclusion, that because for decades, Europe and America, or the North Hemisphere, was trying to develop their economy, they caused, in fact, the poverty in the Southern Hemisphere. And they decided, in order to balance for their own self-interest, to improve the economy of the South divides. And unfortunately, they soon, in spite of committing to reduce their armaments expenditures, they soon offered the same armaments to the same countries under the guise of um, international or, or foreign aids or through the uh, international arms dealings rather than actually addressing the issues. So what I'm saying here is that the politicians and those who are interested in the question of fairness will have to have a global vision. And unless and until a global unity political and social unity is established, we still will face an international problem. It is not just England's, but it is the whole world. Thank you. Thank you. Do I have another question? Uh, lady up the back. Hi. I'm Jenny Jacobs, the Equality Trust. Um, thinking about um, Dr. Atkinson's impassioned um, speech about how we're not really all in it together and what can we do to change things. I think the thing we have to do 
is change the story that is out there. And actually, the message from the spirit level, um, Kate Pickett and Richard Wilkinson's book, was that actually we really are all in it together. Um, the rich may run, but they can't hide. The great thing about the spirit level is that over and over again, the story is proved that not just the poor, but the rich too do better in more equal societies. Now that is an alternative narrative. It's a gong that I think we need to bang over and over to get the message out there that it's in everybody's interests if we do all see ourselves as one society and that it is in everyone's rich and poor alike interest to bring those ends back to the middle and um, reduce inequality and have a society where everybody has a better chance. Thank you very much. There's a question at the back. Thank you. Just to uh, think about Professor Walker's uh, comments again about small areas that can be ineffectual in, in, in tackling inequality and deprivation. I come from a, a, an authority that is in the most 10% deprived areas in the country, which is Blackburn with Darwin. I'm asking the panel a question. Will we benefit from a Northern Assembly? Um, a question down here, please. Try and more money for futures initiative. This morning I was talking about truths and lies. First of all, there are no truths. There are only relative truths, and there are ideological truths. One of the truths is, and it's still around, about the trickle-down effect. As everybody knows, the trickle-down effect results in wet legs and pools on the floor. And in terms of centralization of power, I remember hearing a lord speak. I've forgotten which lord it was, and it doesn't matter. But the point that he was making was about the Westminster bubble, and he was absolutely right about the pockets of insulation which are emotional and intellectual insulation. I can think of nothing more ridiculous in a so-called modern world when we have elites, and they are elites, who determine what's going to happen in the rest of the country. That is absurd. Thank you. Do I have other questions at the moment? Well, while you're thinking about it, I'll go back to the panel and see what your responses are to those initial thoughts. So, about unity, changing the story, if it's more equal, it's good for all of us, Westminster bubbles and so on. So, Roland. Uh, yes, I mean, in terms of the question about, or well, the issue about equality and that narrative, I think that's an important one. I think. Um, I think that's out there, and I think it's you know it has won a lot of people over, and then we just need to keep pushing on that front, really. Um, in terms of, um, I mean, you know, to keep going on about Thomas Piketty, but I think the problem there is you've got a book that is literally, you know, you could stand on it and reach higher up to get other books down, but um, we need modes of translating academic and rigorous research into not sound bites, but into into methods for. Um, you know, galvanizing support for some of those issues. A lot of the reasons why there isn't more uh, attraction on those issues is because the, um, the extent of those inequalities is relatively invisible to people. They are obscured by a news media which is incapable of, you know, distilling that and uh, bringing that information together effectively. Um, in terms of representation and, and the North and so on, you know, I mean, I suppose, um, you know, I'm not a political scientist, so I don't really feel comfortable responding to that. But I, I, you know, I can see value in that. But again, I'm not sure if that tinkers with much deeper problems in terms of uh, one of the speakers this morning was talking about the relationship relationship between capital and labour. And I think you know a lot of what we're talking about takes us back to some of those issues. 
And I think, again, thinking about new patches um, for the problem and coming up with new modes of governance or new geographies for intervention, I don't think that really captures the extent of what needs to be done, perhaps. Thank you. Ati, do you want to No. Alan, several questions about Sheffield. Okay. Uh, I mean, they were wonderful questions, absolutely, that deserve um, much more debate. But the point about globalization, I think, is absolutely spot on. And, um, I was, you know, it's the problem of summary that we have to recognize the, the role of globalization in, in creating those inequalities and the way that the the international governmental organizations manipulate resources and you know pull countries into line with a certain economic model I absolutely would, would, would not discount that um, we have to have a global narrative as, as, as well as a national local one nonetheless despite globalization the nation state is still rather important uh, we can set a framework, and that takes us to the varieties of capitalism argument, you know, that Swedish capitalism, German capitalism, completely different to the Anglo-Saxon variety. So we need that. Uh, we need to be more like the Germans in the corporate sense and more like the Swedes in the, in the, in the equality sense, I've, I, I've no doubt. Then part of the fairness narrative must be the knock-on effects. I've no, no doubt about that whatsoever. Here we're talking about you know, sort of local things, but, but you're right in saying you can't stop there. You've got to say, what, what's the connection between fairness in York and in London and in the UK as a whole and in Europe and in the north and south of, of, of the globe? It's a different argument, but I recognize entirely what you say. In terms of equality trust, changing the narrative, you're, you're right. You're absolutely right about the core message of the spirit level. Of course, you would know that. <laughs> um, but another core message of the spirit level, uh, I'm sure if Richard was in the room, he'd say so, that's that society is crucial. It's societal attitudes. And that's what we need to address and, and what we haven't done. And we, we can do that locally, and we can do it nationally. On um, Wednesday, a colleague and I, who's in, in the room from Sheffield, are, are talking to the, the Sheffield Executive Board, which is the public, private, and third sector executive. And I should say, I'm sure it's OK, that our main mission is to address the Chamber of Commerce. Okay, because a lot of the public sector is on board with this, but the argument is with the private sector. You know, it's about the living wage and it's about fair employment code and so on. So there's a bit of an experiment about how far at a local level you can change the narrative within the private sector as well as the public sector. And I'm, you know, the jury, as far as we're concerned, is, is out on that. We've got the rhetoric, yes, we, we believe, but not the actual implementation, and that's, that's a big challenge. And then um, the issue about the not having a local assembly, I, I, and that's not my message at all. It's a, it's a bit more nuanced than that. I think we need a national framework, but then we've got to address participation and empowerment at local level, and anything we can do to include, particularly the, the more excluded groups, the better it is. It's better for democracy and participation, but it's also better for fairness. Yeah, just about uh, the last uh, observation about the uh, absurd uh, elitism of the institution. Um, I, I think that um, w w what we are trying to do in Tuscany is interesting because uh, we are doing it at a scale which is not a municipal scale, it's a scale, uh, a regional scale, and normally, at least in Italy, regions has been uh, uh, very useful for uh, experimenting innovation that then are uh, reproduced uh, in not always, obviously not mechanically, but at uh, a national uh, level. For example, uh, this experiment of uh, binding participation on big infrastructure that can affect the life of a lot of local people uh, is being observed by the Ministry of Infrastructure and if effective in two years will be proposed uh, for, for being transformed into national law. And I think that some of the elements that we are experimenting at uh, local and regional level, like, uh, for example, um, um, a random selection of citizen in, uh, in, partial, in, in constructing um, arenas for discussion of uh, local and regional 
policies in which a part of the citizen is self-mobilized and the other part is uh, uh, random selected and this random selected people is trained because they could uh, gain the confidence that self-mobilized belonging normally to institutions that have a long story and long capacity of fighting and lobbying uh, could have. So it's, uh, I, I think this could be a way to reduce the, the weight of uh, an elite whose problem is not only ethical in the sense that many of them um, uh, operate like a caste, so pr self-protecting interest and not doing the interest of the, the represented, uh, but uh, also because I'm, uh, I realize that w w I think one other thing you wanted to say is that the elite, they do not know uh, problems because they they are not have the capacity of doing a full immersion in the real problem. So uh, we, we were discussing with a colleague this morning about uh, um, poverty through commission of uh, Scotland, for example, which is doing this interesting uh, public audit with uh, people, you know, recognizing that the elites uh, which are uh, supporting the government has no capacity to understand the problem, and they need someone to leave the problem every day on his and her uh, shoulders. So uh, I think it's possible to complement uh, the, the, the mechanism of representation in, in this way, but maybe I'm a, a bloody optimist. <laughs> I have a question. <clears throat> Anyone else want to indicate? Okay. Thank you. Um, I suppose my question is pretty straightforward. As part of the law discrimination review, one of the things that they were going to incorporate within that was the social economic deprivation duty, which was primarily going to focus on the intersection between particular characteristics and social economic deprivation as a way of tackling poverty type issues and really advancing equality of opportunity for all sections of the community. And the establishment opposed that duty. In fact, it was not incorporated within the Equality Act. The other point, in relation to participatory budgeting, you know, we live in a country where there's large swathes of voter apathy, people don't actually participate in local civic society, and we don't actually have that connectivity between representative participatory democracy the way we would actually like. So that in itself actually causes quite significant issues. If I gave, for example, Doncaster as an example, we're a town of 300,000 people, we have an elected mayor, but actually when 5% of the local electorate actually vote, you get elected over a half a billion pound budget and you actually make a decision over 95% of the local population. They're quite significant issues. So I agree with you, politics absolutely matters. But just in terms of solution, my view is, is it time, you know, frankly we've had all of these fairness commissions and I was listening to an MP earlier today and she was talking about this almost select committee inquiry, how all the chairs actually came and presented what their findings were. And I almost felt, you know, well, what was the outcome of that? You know, so it was fine actually hearing all of those views. Is it, so my question is, is it time actually that we start thinking about democratic reform in this country? So it may be, for example, if you're actually elected and you actually are elected by 5% of the local electorate, you shouldn't actually be, you know, prevailing over the local community. Secondly, and, and, and because it actually tackles some of those elitism issues. So when we talk about, you know, we're all in it together, we are all in it together. 5% actually benefit, the rest absolutely suffer. So the only way we actually tackle those type of issues is to start thinking about what do we need in terms of reform and how, what does that voice actually look like in terms of driving those reforms forward? There's a question at the back over here. Thank you. Um, I wonder if, given what's been said about the uh, significance of um, the, those at the top end as well as those at the bottom and in determining um, fairness, uh, whether the panel will be campaigning against the Transatlantic Trade Investment Partnership, which is a proposal to give big business multinationals far more influence over what uh, individual countries can or can't do within their own economies. Um, I'm going to take one last question in this row. And then I'll go back to the panel for a quick response if they wish. 
Uh, Jenny Briley from Connect Housing Association. Um, a lot of us in this room um, are working to improve social and economic um, circumstances in some of the most deprived areas, sometimes in quite small targeted areas. Um, and we're getting more and more creative with less and less money. Um, I wonder if the panel thinks that we're actually making matters worse by papering over the cracks. Are we actually taking the edge off pressure to have a national, there's a kind of national action that was talked about? And is this a peculiarly British issue that this is what we might be in fact doing? Thank you very much. I'm going to call a halt to questions now. Who would like to respond first? Alan. Yeah, I'm happy to, to, to do it. I mean, no time to do justice to, 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 to the questions, really. Uh, the point about democracy is absolutely right. Of course it needs reforming, because it's not fair. It absolutely isn't. But we're a bit stuck in the rut uh, on, on the democracy front. So I'm much more in favor of local participative um, initiatives to engage people like the assemblies or the you know, local champions to, just to get people engaged um, before we try the, the big transformation in democracy but the more participative it is the better that gets people engaged and, and you know they, they can be part of the campaign for, for greater fairness um, in terms of local action papering over the cracks that's a tremendously difficult one, and, and it's being played out, isn't it, around the food banks at, at the moment and the way the government is, is using the food bank argument completely against the way that the food banks are, 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 have been set up and expanded for in a, in a rather crude political argument. But it must always be the case that we have to take that local action to help people and that must be the first thing. I mean, in terms of, of pure humanity, we must do that and not think that by, you know, by helping, uh, by responding to need, that somehow we're, we're you know, betraying the bigger political cause. You know, that would be awful if we ever departed from the basic human response. That, that, that's what we must do first. So the secret is always in, in the, the old... Um, Paolo Freire uh, idea, you know, the, the, uh, the uh, democracy in, in, in Latin America. It's, you know, it's to, to help the poor immediately, but to use that in the campaign for social change. That's, that's the thing. You have to do both of those things. 